Hello there, and welcome back to A Course in Cognitive Linguistics. In this episode, we'll talk about a very difficult subject, namely cognitive grammar. Cognitive grammar is one of the major approaches to structures and meanings of grammar in cognitive linguistics, and it has been developed by Ron Lanneker, first in his landmark publications, Foundations of Cognitive Grammar, uh, Volume 1, 1987, and Volume 2, 1991. There are more recent uh, books available that you can check out, but these are the classic references. They're still widely cited, and in them, uh, Ron Lanneker explain how the theory works. Right, um, the fact that we're dealing with a theory that has been developed to a large extent by a single individual makes cognitive grammar a little different from other approaches in cognitive linguistics that I've talked about in earlier videos. So essentially, when you read Lanneker, you have to read him as a philosopher. Yeah? You have to interpret what he says, and you have to figure out what he means. And it's not so unusual that at conferences you'll, you'll hear people saying things like, well, if you read Lanneker carefully, then yada, yada, yada. And other people will, you know, scratch their chin and pretend that they understand. And what I'm saying is, it's difficult. You have to get used to it. You have to, um, yeah, spend some time familiarizing yourself with the terminology that he uses. And what this video will do, in part, is to take some of the most important technical terms and go over them. All right, uh, but let me start by first situating cognitive grammar in uh, the context of usage-based linguistics. In many ways, cognitive grammar is how usage-based linguistics got started. Um, usage-based linguistics, I talked about this in an earlier video, assumes that language use shapes linguistic knowledge, that language use shapes language change, that communicative functions shape language form, and that language is grounded in general cognitive processes. And all of these things actually go back to the work of Ron Lanneker, and especially the last one here, language is grounded in general cognitive processes, is the, the cornerstone, really, of cognitive grammar. <clears throat> so many ideas that originated with Lanneker's cognitive grammar are now actually widely held and very important in cognitive linguistics, among them the idea that knowledge of language is knowledge of a network of symbolic units that pair sounds with meanings. That's sort of the foundational idea of construction grammar as we now know it, and Lanneker has been arguing this for a very long time. Uh, also, the idea that lexicon and grammar are not distinct modules, but instead form a continuum from very concrete symbols like chair and dog to very schematic symbols like subject and relative clause. That's Lanneker, yeah? So the idea that subject it's not just an abstract grammatical category, a matter of form. No, it's something that's meaningful. Uh, it's a symbol. That's something that Lanneker has been arguing for a long time. <clears throat> uh, he also came up with the term usage-based. So uh, the idea that knowledge of language results from language use and that speakers know symbolic units because they make abstractions over usage events. That's cognitive grammar. Right. In many ways, however, Lanneker's project goes beyond vanilla usage-based linguistics. So his project is a truly cognitive grammar, reducing all of grammar to cognitive things. Right. Let me spell this out. Um, the first part of this is that all linguistic structures are meaningful. So even very abstract grammatical categories like subject, noun, preposition, relative clause, progressive aspect, the infinitive, the past tense, finiteness, modal auxiliaries, and so on and so forth. All of this is supposed to be meaningful. Yeah. Um, and a second part of that hypothesis is that the meanings of these structures should be fully described in cognitive and perceptual terms. So all of these meanings should relate to these basic domain general cognitive processes that I talked about in the usage-based video. Okay, uh, Lanneker's analyses often um, involve uh, visual representations of meaning, little diagrams, 
Um, and I've given you three little examples here. First of all, the preposition into, I have a trajectory, TR, we'll get to that, and LM, that means landmark, and into means that the trajectory enters the landmark, in the middle, we have a visualization of the present progressive. I'm reading this interesting book right now, uh, which focuses on sort of the, the um, middle part of a situation. Yeah, So if I say I'm reading this great book right now, um, you can sort of infer that well, my, my reading process must have had a beginning phase and it will have an end phase, but those phases are defocused right now. We're focusing on the immediate scope, as Lanneker call it, uh, what's going on right now. The third example here, uh, the infinitive to walk as opposed to the noun, a walk, uh, shows you how the same meanings, yeah, so both diagrams have the same components, the same um, elements to them, but what's different is which elements are in focus. Yeah, we'll talk about something that Lenniker calls construal. Um, that's very important here. To walk invites you to focus on the uh, small component parts of a walking action. A walk invites you to think of the whole thing as a whole homogeneous thing. Right. We'll talk about each of these aspects in more detail as we go along. Right, um, so the job of the cognitive grammarian would be to describe all grammatical structures in terms of their meanings, and then to analyze those meanings in terms of general cognitive processes. Right. Um, the radicalness of cognitive grammar shows itself in the simplicity of you know, how simple grammar is really supposed to be. So Lanneker is very, very strict in this uh, and argues that grammar should really just consist of three things. What he says is that the only units permitted in the grammar of a language, so your knowledge of language, are first, semantic, phonological, and symbolic structures that occur overtly in linguistic expressions. So, in other words, the words and structures that you have heard, you know, no invisible stuff. Second, uh, structures that are schematic for those in one, generalizations that you make over the structures that you hear. And third, categorizing relationships involving the structures in one and two. So, analyzing something in terms of a superordinate category. Right, uh, so you already see that the cognitive skills of schematization and categorization loom large in cognitive grammar. Other perceptual mechanisms are also very important, and we'll get to that in just a minute. Uh, but first, you know, to make this a little more concrete, uh, let me rephrase this. So the stuff grammars are made of are the following. First, sounds and structures, like tree, I don't know, could you pass the salt, things like that. Second, schemas on the basis of the sounds and structures. So if you have a category noun, that means that you know, you've schematized uh, words like tree and cat and table and uh, apple and so on and so forth. <clears throat> Same for sentence types like subject, verb phrase, or auxiliary subject, verb phrase. And then lastly, there are categorizing relationships between one and two so that you um, sort of have links between tree as a linguistic expression and noun as a linguistic category. All right, <clears throat> let's attack the technical terms. Um, I've got a bunch of them, we'll go through them, and uh, once we're through, I think you're in a fairly good position to, to read an actual text by Lanneker and, and figure it out on your own because that's what you need to do if you want to get anywhere with cognitive grammar. So. The first pair of terms are profile and base. What Lenneker says is that all expressions are characterized semantically by the imposition of a profile on a base. What does that mean? Actually, it refers, well, it relates very closely to things that I've been discussing in the last video on frame semantics. So, uh, frame semantics, as 
argued by Chuck Fillmore, um, is that linguistic expressions evoke a frame, yeah, some general recurrent situation or uh, event or thing, and highlight a part of that frame. The evoked frame, that's the base, and the highlighted part of that frame is what Lanneker calls the profile. So profiling, highlighting, that is uh, what Lanneker means. Um, I've given you three examples here from Lanneker. So the word hypotenuse would be uh, evoking the frame of a right angle triangle and it profiles the longest edge of that right angle triangle. Uh, the word tip evokes an elongated object and it profiles the end part of that elongated object. The word uncle um, evokes a kinship network, unless you know how kinship works, how, how people are related in families, the word uncle doesn't have any meaning to you. Like, if you don't know how soccer works, offside doesn't mean anything to you. And if you're from Mars and, you know, the Roman calendar doesn't really mean anything to you, uh, if I tell you, let's meet on Friday, you'll be like, all right, Friday? Um, okay, so I guess you see what I'm saying. Uh, profile and base, they, they match very closely the Fillmorean idea of a frame. Okay, um, I've already talked about trajectory and landmark, and uh, what Lenniker says is the following. A relational predication elevates one of its participants to the, to the status of figure. I refer to this participant as its trajectory. Other salient participants are referred to as landmarks. So when we have um, a, a frame or a situation that is evoked within that frame, the most prominent thing is the trajectory and a less prominent participant is a landmark. And you've already seen the uh, visualization of the preposition into. Okay, moving on to less straightforward things, namely thing. Um, what's a thing? Well, you and I use the word thing, so it should be straightforward enough. Alas, it is not. Um, a thing in Lanneker's terminology is a region in some domain of conceptual space. I'll repeat that. It's a region in some domain of conceptual space. Um, okay, it's probably not clear yet, uh, so let me try another Lanneker quote. Uh, a noun is a symbolic structure that designates a thing. Okay. That's something that sounds straightforward enough. It is reminiscent of sort of uh, semantic uh, characterizations of parts of speech. Like when your first grade teacher told you that, okay, there are thing words, cat, apple, table, chalk, uh, and there are do words like run. And, uh, and of course, in your introductory uh, linguistics class, um, your, <laughs> your instructor told you that, look, it doesn't really work that way. There are things like explosion, and there are things like paragraph and moment and B-flat and electricity. They're not things. They're not physical objects. Okay. Um, they're not. Um, they're not physical objects. They're regions in some domain of conceptual space. There are things that you can conceptualize as sort of encapsuled different from the rest of the situation that you're talking about. So a cube is a bounded region in three-dimensional space. That's straightforward enough. A moment, it's a bounded region in time. Yeah. Um, this was a moment. Um, a paragraph is a portion of a written work with boundaries. B flat, it's already a little more difficult. Uh, that's a point-like region on the musical scale. You have perfect pitch. Try to uh, sing B flat. <laughs> um, more difficult still, electricity, a bounded region in the space of physical characteristics. Now, here I have to say, I have no idea how electricity works. And um, to me, it's kind of a coincidence that we would, as, as speakers of English, verbalize electricity as a noun. Um, but hey, to some people, it made sense to think of electricity as a bounded region 
in the space of physical characteristics. So those are things, not physical objects, but things that you can imagine being object-like. Lenniker contrasts things with relations. So here he says relational expressions profile the interconnections among conceived entities. So all parts of speech that invite you to think of stuff that is non-autonomous, that you can think of as things, uh, for instance, prepositions, adjectives, adverbs, or verbs, they profile, in Lenniker's terminology, relations. So, for instance, uh, the preposition above is about the relation between two things which are uh, organized in space. Um, the adjective red, yeah, you can think of redness as something that's autonomous, but the adjective red is something that you know is either an attribute of something else or uh, you you predicate this quality over something else. So that's what it's all about. It's a relation. Quickly is a characteristic of something else, an action, and run presupposes somebody doing the action. So again, there's a relation going on and not a thing. Relational expressions profile interconnections among conceived entities. Okay, um, Lenniker shows you how he, well, in his, let me start differently. Um, Lanneker uses these notions of thing and relation in many of his analyses, and so this is sort of the visual vocabulary of the um, diagrams that you see in Lanneker's work. And uh, so a thing, as we've just defined it, is um, visualized as a circle, thing like a cube. A relation is a dotted line between two squares. We'll get to what these squares mean, one of them being a trajectory, one a landmark, like above. Um, <clears throat> a complex atemporal relation, like into. And into can be atemporal, like the road into town. Um, it's complex. There are several different relations uh, compressed into to one single word meaning. And there are processes which are expressed by verbs, yeah? grow, uh, different relations that change over time. Right, um, so what are these squares right now? The, the circles are things, okay, but what are the uh, squares? The squares are entities, and you may wonder, okay, an entity, is that different from a thing? Um, well, <clears throat> the horrible truth is that uh, the term entity applies to anything that might be conceived of as or referred to in describing conceptual structure, things, relations, quantities, sensations, changes, locations, dimensions, and so on and so forth. So a square is something like an underspecified thing. Okay, it could be a thing, it could be a relation, it could be something entirely different. Right, okay. Bear with me, bear with me, we're, we're getting there. So, um, one important notion in cognitive grammar that has found applications even outside of cognitive grammar is construal. Uh, Lenniker defines it in the following way. Construal is our ability to conceive and portray the same situation in alternate ways. Every lexical and grammatical element incorporates as an inherent aspect of its meaning a certain way of construing the conceptual content evoked. So, um, your ability to take a perspective on things in the world, that is construal. And you, see, you again see this is a very visual metaphor, taking a perspective, you know, uh, seeing the world, but really it is at work in many different linguistic domains. So, one manifestation of construal is, for instance, uh, the arrangement of trajectory and landmark. If I say the table is under the lamp or the lamp is over the table, I refer to the same state of affairs. But crucially, um, what I'm saying is also different. It's different in terms of how I construe the situation, how I invite my hearer to think about the situation. 
um, and what's crucial here is the reversal of trajectory and landmark. In the table is under the lamp. I want you to think of the table as a trajectory, yeah? uh, the more important, the more salient thing, whereas in the lamp is above the table. Yeah? It's the same spatial arrangement, but I want you to think of the lamp as the trajectory, the important salient thing. Construal. Um, construal also um, you know, pertains to, to profile and base. So when I say the neighbors are away or the neighbors are gone, uh, again, in terms of you know, objective states of affairs, that's very much the same. However, um, you, know, you can look at these two diagrams of Lanikris and um, make out a difference between away and gone, and that is that gone is the end state of a, a temporal complex relation going, um, whereas away doesn't have that kind of base, okay? So gone has a different base than away, while both have the same profile, both profile the same state of affairs. Right. Another example of construal, um, if I want to express the fact that um, Bill had in his possession a walrus, which he no longer wanted and um, transferred to Joyce, I, I could say Bill sent a walrus to Joyce, or I could say Bill sent Joyce a walrus. Not my examples, they're crazy. You know, linguists, sometimes they are crazy. Um, or should I say, sometimes they are sane. Um, again, the same base, but different profiles. So what is the base is that uh, we have Bill with a walrus at first, and then without one, and uh, Joyce at first without a walrus, sadly, and then with a walrus. So that's the same across A and B. But what's profiled is a little different. Uh, so the prepositional dative, the first example here, Bill sent a walrus to Joyce, profiles the sending process, so Bill's active act of you know, sending the thing, the animal, to Joyce, and um, what's profiled in the second uh, verbalization, the ditransitive, is that Joyce is now in the lucky possession of a walrus. Congratulations. Okay, um, another aspect of construal is schematicity. You may verbalize a state of affairs applying different levels of schematicity. So I might say the boy opened the door, being maximally specific, the boy did something, a little less specific, and then something happened, maximally schematic. And again, also that is you know, uh, something that's perceptual and yeah? schematicity. Uh, we can have pictures of faces that are very naturalistic and then um, less naturalistic, more, more stylized, and then uh, iconic in the last example here. Okay, so construal, your ability to um, take different perspectives on the world, manifests itself in very different ways. Um, a last example is um, uh, the, the alternate way of construing something as a process or as a thing. So when I say I saw how the bridge collapsed and I saw the bridge, the collapse of the bridge, again, that's referring to the same state of affairs, but I present this idea differently as a process in the one case and as a thing in the other. And you see that um, you know, the, the bits and pieces of the situation are the same, but what's different is the profile. Yeah? Um, in process, I profile the individual parts, and in the thing construal, I profile the whole thing as one homogeneous unit. Okay, so this is um, this last example relates to a terminological distinction that Lanneker makes between sequential scanning versus summary scanning. I thought I'd just tell you that. Um, he describes that the same content can be construed as either a process or a non-processual relationship depending on whether it's accessed via sequential scanning process or summary scanning thing. All right. Linguistic units.
that's another important term uh, in cognitive grammar. The term unit is employed in a technical sense to indicate a thoroughly mastered structure that is a cognitive routine. And you've seen this picture of the tennis serve before. A tennis serve consists of many, many complex movements, which, however, as a professional tennis player, you have come to master as one single routine. That's this linguistic unit with regard to, you know, sentence patterns, complex words, things like that. <clears throat> um, what Lenniker says with regard to linguistic units is that uh, only three basic types of units are posited, semantic, phonological, and symbolic. So sound, meaning, and the link between. Uh, a symbolic unit is said to be bipolar, consisting of a semantic unit defining one pole and a phonological pole defining the other. If this reminds you of Saussurian uh, symbols, then you're absolutely right. That's what it is. Okay, The kind of radical idea in this is that um, Lanneker tries to reduce grammar to sounds and meanings. And to many people, uh, well, many people are kind of baffled and, and think, all right, what do we do with morphosyntax, with structures? And, um, well, he has an answer. I won't go into that right now, but um, that's something that you should look out for. Okay, uh, more on linguistic units. Um, these units vary along the parameters of complexity and specificity. So um, there are more or less complex units. So cat is a very simple monomorphemic unit. Blackboard has some internal structure. Football coach has a more complex uh, structure still. So that's one uh, dimension of variation, complexity. And schematicity is another such dimension. So tree is not very schematic, it's very specific. But if you compare tree to linguistic units like noun or verb, yeah, grammatical categories that you have, they are a lot more schematic so that for noun, well, they denote things, which is a very general notion. And with regard to sound, they're completely unspecified. Yeah. Um, so here, when you see those three dots, that means heaven only knows what you know what sound may be there. Um, it's generally underspecified. And the same for verb, you know, any sound whatsoever. And this conceptual structure here, that's supposed to be a verb, yeah, a relation between trajectory and landmark that unfolds over time. That's what verbs mean in cognitive grammar. Okay, that means that you can arrange the inventory of grammatical units in uh, a grid like this one, uh, where you have two dimensions, sim symbolic complexity on the x-axis and schematicity on the y-axis. We have uh, very simple things like, like morphemes, um, down here, they're symbolically simple and uh, specific. Category schemas like noun and verbs, they are uh, not complex, but they're very schematic. Um, heavy compounds like football, coach, seminar, they are um, symbolically complex, but not very schematic. And of course, the interesting stuff goes on here, um, where we have constructional schemas that are both complex and very schematic. Yeah? Cleft sentences, relative clauses, complement clauses, questions, that kind of thing. Right. <clears throat> um, another thing that I wanted to mention about linguistic units is that uh, they are conventionalized. And the way that Lanneker visualizes this in his diagrams is with um, cornery corners. Okay, uh, Cornery corners are representing conventionalized units and round corners uh, denote novel expressions. So pencil sharpener is a conventionalized noun. Chalk sharp sharpener is not. Okay, so chalk sharpener is a new thing that uh, you probably just heard for the first time. Round corners. <clears throat> um, units can be combined. Yeah? So as in uh, 
ordinary approaches to syntax that you would be familiar with, uh, words can be combined into phrases, phrases can be combined into sentences, and there's something uh, called constituency that I'll talk about in just a minute. Uh, so here you see that there's a composite expression above the table. We have um, the preposition above, we have the noun table, and uh, we have the non-conventionalized composite expression above the table. Yeah, But of course the, the schema for the prepositional phrase that allows you to say things like above the table, that is conventionalized. Yeah, So there's a conventionalized schema that tells you you can combine a preposition and a noun into a prepositional phrase in this way. <clears throat> Bear with me. You're still there, right? Yeah, okay. Um, so I mentioned the term constituency, um, the way phrases are combined into larger units. Lanneker uh, frames this as uh, the order in which symbolic structures are progressively assembled into larger and larger composite expressions. To, to him, it's not really just the tree-like structure of a syntactic, complex syntactic sentence. No? Your linguistics intro class probably has made you think that that's what constituency is all about, and in many ways it is. Yeah, But uh, it's important to keep in mind, Lanneker, to him, it's all about meaning, and the structural aspects sort of come along for the trip. Uh, let me give you a little example here. Uh, so this would be a complex sentence like the lamp is above the table. Uh, and the constituency of this is, uh, so let's maybe start in the middle. Yeah, We have the lamp, subject of the sentence, and then we have be above the table, uh, the verb phrase, which consists of be, and then um, the expression above the table. So first of all, be and above the table are assembled into a constituent, be above the table, and uh, lamp and be above the table are integrated into this complex unit, um, the lamp is above the table. Okay, you can spend a few minutes with this diagram tracing all the dotted lines and see how they correspond. Um, essentially what this is, is a semantic account of constituency that um, reduces much of the syntactic trees that you've uh, drawn in your intro class to semantic relations. Right. Another term that I want to introduce is elaboration. Here Lenneker says, uh, it's typical in a construction for one component structure to contain a schematic sub -sub substructure which the other component serves to elaborate, that is, characterize in finer grained detail. And another quote is, uh, a schematic element elaborated by another component is called an elaboration site, or e-site for short. Now what does this mean? Um, actually, it's not rocket science. It's that many linguistic forms project other linguistic forms, or you know, a range of linguistic forms. So if I tell you, um, well, under, yeah, under, projects a following idea. You know, if, if I tell you something is under, you come to expect, well, under what? You know, under the table, under the bed, um, under the sea, where is it? Okay, so under projects a slot for a noun. Yeah, And the slot for a noun, that is what Lenniker calls the elaboration site or E site. So C would elaborate under. Um, so, uh, in a bit more graphic detail, prepositions such as near occur with nominals that provide a more detailed description of the speaker's idea. So, uh, the door elaborates near. So, near, near, um, <clears throat> uh, the door corresponds to the landmark of this prepositional expression. Elaboration sites are those open slots 
in complex constructions. If you're familiar with you know, work in construction grammar, you probably know all about constructions and their slots. Um, so this may be the nominal in a prepositional phrase near the door. It may be the noun in a noun phrase with a determiner, the door. Or it may be the object nominal in a transitive verb phrase, open the door. So the crucial thing is that many linguistic expressions work this way. Yeah? They, they raise the expectation of something else coming up. And this raising the expectation, now that's the open slot, the e site in Lenniker's terminology. Okay, last term, very important term and a very difficult term. So if you're already tired, maybe you know, pause the video, grab a cup of coffee and then come back. I, I sure could use a cup of coffee right now. I'll make one in a minute. Um, grounding. Grounding is proposed as a technical term in cognitive grammar to characterize grammatical predications that indicate the relationship of a designated entity to the ground or situation of speech, including the speech event itself, its participants, in their respective fears of knowledge. Oh, I can, I can hear you wincing. Um, well, um, grounding predications are obligatory grammatical elements needed to turn nouns into full nominals and verbs into finite clauses. Okay, that gives us something. Grounding turns nouns into nominals and verbs into finite clauses. So grounding really is about um, making nominals that are uh, that belong to a certain speech situation and finite clauses that make a clause more concrete with regard to a certain speech situation. Let me um, start with nominal grounding. So grounding elements in the nominal domain are things like a, uh, the, this, my, his, some, many. So markers that allow you to express the categories of definiteness or indefiniteness. Yeah, Is it a cat or is it the cat? That makes a difference for our speech situation. If I talk about the cat, you know which cat in our speech situation that I'm talking about. Quantification, yeah, some cat, many cats, or dykes, uh, this, that, those. Those are elements that allow you, as a hearer, to figure out what kind of thing in the situation I'm talking about. So those are nominal grounding elements. <clears throat> um, if we compare that to verbal grounding elements, here we have essentially the inflectional suffixes, the inflectional verbal suffixes of English, um, yeah, present tense s, past tense ed, um, ing, but also auxiliaries, yeah, modal auxiliaries, would and will, uh, and then other auxiliary constructions, be verbing or have verbed things like that. Right. Um, Lenniker calls this clausal grounding, so grounding in the verbal domain, clausal grounding, and it is mainly concerned with the status of events with respect to their actual or potential occurrence. So this means um, verbal grounding tells you when did something take place? Are we sure that it took place? How did it take place? So essentially modality aspect intense. That's, what, that's what's the job of verbal grounding elements. So grounding, in a way, is a superordinate category that Lanneker develops that includes finiteness, definiteness, and other you know, categories like dykes that um, are there to link a certain expression to the speech situation. It's a complex idea, I don't expect you to understand it right away, but um, no, you'll come back to it and you'll eventually develop an understanding of it. Summing up, um, so cognitive grammar is best understood against the backdrop of usage-based linguistics in general. It is largely responsible for the main assumptions that people make in usage-based linguistics. And the main thing to keep in mind about cognitive grammar is that it tries to reduce all of grammar to general cognitive processes, it tries to explain you know, the meanings and structures of grammar in terms of general cognitive processes, like figure ground perception, yeah? seeing things and relations. 
in terms like profile and base and trajectory and landmark that is you now that is hugely informed by figure ground perception categorization seeing a word like cat as a noun or um, a question like uh, could you pass me the salt as a question schematization seeing the similarities between he ate it and Mary baked the cake you know they're, they're both instances of the transitive construction automatization yeah remembering pencil sharpener as a unit uh, so from round corners to cornery corners I actually would have liked the conventionalized units to be round because you know first edges are sharp and then they wear off then they're round well Lenneker has it the other way round and you know who am I to uh, complain about that perspective taking construal now, adopting different mental points of view upon hearing the cat was chased away, away versus uh, the dog chased the cat away. That is um, an important aspect of cognitive grammar. All right, we come to an end here. Uh, thanks for hearing me out, um, and I'll hopefully see you next time.